Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Today, we're going to watch our P's and Q's, look out for dangling participles and misplaced modifiers, and try to avoid an epidemic of commas. That's because I'm talking with Mary Norris, whose name you may not be familiar with, but whose stamp of approval is on every issue of The New Yorker. Page okayer and query proofreader of the magazine, she is a keeper of the grammar flame. And in her new book, she describes just what that entails. Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen has just been published by W.W. W. Norton and Company. Welcome. Thank you. I have never heard of the job, job descriptions for a page okayer or query proofreader, so you can explain what, those, what that means. Well, basically it's a copy editor with extra responsibility. A copy editor makes the, sure things are spelled right, and at The New Yorker, we spell things a little differently sometimes. We have our own style mm -hmm. on certain words. And when a piece is going to press, the copy editor for each piece, there's a, about six of us who cover the entire contents of the magazine. We read it. We read it several times along with the fact checker, the author, and the editor. And then it is the page okayer's duty to put the changes on the electronic file and to keep a paper trail and to make sure no mistakes are introduced during the editorial process. So do you have the final say on any copy before it goes into the magazine? Is that you? Yes, the page okayer does. Okay, yes. okay. Um, you grew up in Cleveland, uh, made your way to Vermont, and then at some point just decided you were just gonna, like many others, I'm going to New York. <laughs> did you come here with the, you landed at the New Yorker, but did you come here with the idea of becoming a writer, becoming an actress, becoming, you know, with that kind, those kinds of dreams or, or what? Well, it's funny, early on I did have dreams of becoming an actress, but I'd come east first to go to college in New Jersey at Rutgers and then up to graduate school in Vermont. And I wanted to be a writer. And the academic route didn't seem to suit me. I'd gotten a master's in English at the University of Vermont, but the outlet for writing in academia was a little strict. You know, always find some little tiny thing nobody else has noticed, and then you go to a meeting and you read your paper, and that just wasn't right. doing it for right. me. So I thought I'd try commercial publishing. And tell me how you lucked into your job at The New Yorker. Well, I was trying to find some way to keep body and soul together here. I did dishwashing. I worked in a, as a cashier in the old Corvettes discount store, and I did temp work. But I had become friends with Peter and Jan Fleshman through my sibling. And Peter was the chairman of the board of The New Yorker. And once he realized I really did want to work at The New Yorker, he arranged for me to call and speak with the executive editor, who was Robert Bingham at the time. And there were no openings, so I went away again and did some more dishwashing. But Peter encouraged me to call back. I was going to get a hack license. I thought maybe I could drive a taxi. And I called back. There were some openings. I took a couple typing tests. I failed one for the typing pool, and I passed the other, which was for the editorial library the archive of the magazine. So that was my entry level position. Okay. So what did you do? What did you do in the library? Oh, it was fun. We read the magazine and indexed it. That is we filed it under subject, author and title. So we had to decide what what it was about, what a piece was about. Same with the cartoons. And then we wrote up summaries of the articles and of the fiction, and we even summarized the poetry, and that's not easy. Oh, my goodness. But then there was the physical part of it. We took the magazine apart with a single-edge single razor, you know, just slicing up the columns, and we'd paste individual pieces into the writer's scrapbooks. So there are these huge, big, beautiful volumes, one for John Updike, one for John McPhee, one for Sylvia Townsend Warner. Every writer who'd written a um, substantial amount had his or her own scrapbook. Others were um, in, you know, alphabetical E. So you were really cutting and pasting in the old-fashioned sense of cutting and pasting. Seriously, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then you went from there to collating, the collating? That's right. Mm -hmm. Collating was where I learned everything really about the magazine. That's where it was kind of a medieval sounding job, but the proofs from the checker, the fact checker, the proofreaders, the editor, the author, they all came into the collating office and we collated all those changes out to one clean proof for the printer. We did it by hand in pencil. I didn't have the best handwriting, but it was vaguely legible, so I was able to work in that job. But that's where I saw what everybody else did. I saw what the proofreaders did, what the fact checkers did, and it, I learned a lot in that job. Not just about the language and the way the magazine worked, but the process of putting the magazine, of putting a magazine together. You really. got to the New Yorker, I think, in 1977? 78, Is that correct? 78. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, um, women who worked for publications, for publishing houses, seemed to do all of the rather tedious grunt work. Was that your experience that you find that? Well, I, I guess there were a lot of women and there was a lot of tedious grunt work. But, you know, since then, things have changed so that those jobs have come to be seen for good jobs. And now many of them have been filled by men, too. Mm -hmm. um, when people write about, uh, when I read stories about, you know, the, the New Yorker or other literary venues, sometimes publishing houses, um, the author always has stories about some, uh, usually some older female employees who've been there for 40 years, are very quirky, sometimes tyrannical, uh, certainly uh, tyrannically devoted to the, to, to the place, maybe scary to work for. Uh, you seem to have, you, did you meet any people like that? You read my book, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> Well, I'm not surprised that they existed in other places, but the New Yorker had two legendary proofreaders in my time who were on the 19th floor where everything happened in editorial when I started. One was Eleanor Gould, and she was a genius, and she read everything in the magazine in galley. That is, at, she gave things a preliminary reading before they were scheduled to run in the magazine and she knew everything, and she, her proofs looked like dreadlocks. So, you know, she could find four mistakes in a five-word sentence, that kind of thing. And she was a little forbidding. You, know, you had to learn, and when, you didn't, when I didn't know something, I'd go to her and ask. And she, she was basically kind, but sometimes she could make you feel really small for having to ask a question. The other one was Lou Burke, who was more of a swaggery type, and she disagreed with what Eleanor did a lot. Eleanor um, made personal judgments and put her personal preferences into pieces, whereas Lou was very attuned to the voice of the writer, and she stayed out of it. She made, she cleaned it up. She sifted out the mistakes, but she was a frustrated person, and she would yell at anyone who um, crossed her, or even anyone who crossed her path without actually crossing her in any other you know, intellectual way. So she frightened me at first. But you know, I kept telling myself, well, I actually haven't done anything wrong. And so I would keep facing up to her. And she was a really good one to ask questions, because she allowed that there was sometimes a choice that a lot of things were subjective in the language and you just had to do your best to apply your own mind and make sure the writer was saying what the writer meant to say. What was the process of um, you know some copy that had been approved for publication? What, what did it go through the process it went through be, on its way to getting into the magazine? Well, it starts with the writer and a manuscript and the editor. And, you know, I don't know how it all works, but I think sometimes the, well, obviously the writer and the editor talk. Sometimes the idea comes from the writer. Sometimes it comes from somebody else, but the editor chooses the writer. So there's the manuscript and the editor and the author. And they work together on that privately. But once it's introduced into the system, 
at the magazine, it gets copy edited. And that's when we spell the words our way, we punctuate things the way we like to punctuate them, that is we introduce some commas once in a while and some hyphens. And then, then the piece goes into galley, right, just the columns, and it gets read again by one of the okayers, one of the query proofreaders. Eleanor Gould is no longer with us, but we still call that reading the Gould reading. And mm -hmm. we ask, has a piece been Goulded? So she has turned into a verb. So that proof goes to the editor, and uh, the editor decides with the author which changes to take. At the same time, the editor is getting changes from fact-checking, from the editor-in-chief, from um, managing editors. Lots of people weigh in, and all those changes go on, and then the piece is scheduled to run, and then the okayer reads it again. A proofreader reads it behind the query, the query proofreader, the page okayer, and we give those changes again to the editor. And then the piece goes to what we call the makeup department. I think other places call it production or layout. And they put it, they, um, put it in a form in the page with the cartoons placed. And then everybody reads it yet again. The proofreader, the fact checker, the editor, and the author. And we, the page okayer has to decide if any cartoons reflect in a way, in an unintended way on the piece and make sure the page breaks are okay and that all the changes have been incorporated correctly. And then at the last minute before it goes to press, we sit down at a table, we go over the proof a page at a time, everybody's the checker, the author, the editor, the proofreader, we all say what little changes we might still have or transpositions. And then the page okayer puts those changes into the electronic file has a, it keeps the paper trail, and then it gets read again by a department called the Foundry Proofreaders, who compare the new version against the old version and take care of all the little details. That's quite a process. I'm exhausted just hearing <laughs> about it. And since and I'm and to get and to get a little rest, you know, from my exhaustion, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back with more with Mary Norris, the author of Between You and Me: Confessions of a Comma Queen. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Mary Norris, author of Between You and Me, Confessions of a Grammar Queen. It's just been published by W.W. W. Norton and Company. Let's talk about some of the common issues in copy editing. Spelling. Uh, we've got spell check now. Is that not enough? Certainly is not enough. The spell check is valuable, and I always use it on a piece. I at least run it once. But the spell check does not recognize context. So there are many words that are spelt different and sound the same. For instance, the word gate, G-A-T-E, the closure of a fence, and gate, G-A-I-T, the way a person walks. Those words will not be recognized by spell check and could go through wrong. So you consult the, um, the Webster Dictionary or the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Why Webster? Why, why, what's, what's so great about Webster? Now, when I was, I spent a, a year at Harvard and they recommended the American Heritage Dictionary. Is Webster just better for spelling? The American Heritage Dictionary is fine. Webster was, Noah Webster was the great American lexicographer. And for some reason, we've always stuck with Webster at the New Yorker from um, earliest times. I think it was before American Heritage came out, it was before Random House came out, they used Webster's, Merriam-Webster's at the New Yorker. And there are the three editions that we keep, the most recent collegiate edition, which is in its 11th edition, Webster's second unabridged, the gigantic one from the 1930s, which is a beautiful object in addition to having lots of information in it, and Web 3, Webster's third, which was printed in the 60s, and caused a huge ruckus because it included words like, uh, well, ain't, but ain't was also in Webster's second. 
but the thing was that it included words without giving instruction on whether or not they were vulgar and warning you whether or not you should use them. So American Heritage does that. American Heritage has this usage panel. The only reason I think we don't use American Heritage more at The New Yorker is that we are kind of our own usage panel. Mm -hmm. When we want to know something, we go out in the hall and we, we discuss it discuss amongst it. ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, the use of commas. Uh, I have to tell you, confess, that your rather lengthy discussion of, 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 of the, how commas should be used made my eyes roll around in my head. <laughs> Do people tend to overuse commas or just n not know well, how to use them? I've never heard anyone complain about anyone underusing commas. So certainly people say that the New Yorker sometimes overuses the comma. We do have a reason for every comma that's in the magazine. Um, the tendency in newspapers and advertising is more towards streamlining. So they, they use fewer commas in those publications. I think I did get a little complicated because there are so many options when it comes to commas. A lot of people, writers, punctuate by ear. They are still, it's kind but of there's a, a pause, a natural pause, they put a comma there. Right. Mm -hmm. I personally think that a lot of those pauses are dependent on word order and you can do without the commas in a lot of places. But the comma, of course, is the way you tell whether something is restrictive or non-restrictive, those words that make people's eyes roll around mm -hmm. in their heads. But you did say that a sensible rule is that you put commas where they need to be in order to make the copy say what the writer intended it to say, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, should we just abandon the semicolon and tell people to use col periods? <laughs> If they don't know how to use the semicolon. Then most don't seem to. That's true. Um, they use it as a kind of an industrial strength comma. They just think if the sentence is long, a comma isn't enough and it has to have a semicolon. But I don't think we should abandon it. I think if it were going to be abandoned, it would have happened a while ago. There are so few marks of punctuation that we use that anything that has survived this long obviously has its uses. You just have to remember that following a semicolon, you have to have a complete clause. Mm -hmm. Except, yeah, and you hope that people know what a clause is, and often they don't. Well, a clause has a verb in it. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Work Hyphen, verb. Hyphens and dashes. So what's the difference? Well, a hyphen is more a piece of spelling than it is punctuation. A hyphen will tie together two words in a compound. I give the example of a bus driver and a school bus and a school bus driver, so that school bus would be hyphenated. And so those are issues of spelling. The hyphen is also used, of course, to justify, to break a word by syllable so that you, know, you can have a justified line on the right. A dash is a mark of punctuation, and it's a very versatile mark of punctuation. It's longer, physically it's just longer than a hyphen. We used to, in the old days, type two hyphens to make a dash, but now the word processing um, machinery just goes ahead and makes a dash out of it once we get to the end of the next word. The dash can be used for some, it gives a little bit more oomph when you want to pause. A lot of people just use nothing but dashes. I, I quote a note from Jackie Kennedy in the book where she just always use dashes. It has a bit of a breathy effect. It's, and she was certainly breathy. Yes, actually it was a very nice very way of, um, of representing her, her speech. Her voice, right, right. Yes. Right. <clears throat> so you can use the dash as a colon, you can use it as terminal punctuation, you can use it just as a mark to introduce something in a list, and you can use it as a semicolon. I think it works especially well in dialogue. Mm -hmm. Some, okay. people, some writers use semicolons in dialogue, and I always think, unless you're talking with a brilliant professor, that probably people do not speak in semicolons. Um, w w an interesting part of the book was where you talked about, uh, you listed some of the words that people commonly mispronounce, and I realized that I've been pronouncing all, mispronouncing all of these words. What, is, what are some of them? Well, the one that surprised me was elegiac. I always said elegiac, and somebody wrote me a note 
giving me a link to the pronunciation mm -hmm. of elegiac on Webster's or on some dictionary, and it was elegiac, and I had thought it was a joke. Some others are the word um, chimera, that's uh, from the Greek. Which I would have said chimera. I've always said right. chimera, right. and I've come to find out it's chimera. Um, what are some others? There are some very simple ones, too. That the heir see. of a wealthy family. Is a scion? I think so. Okay, okay, S-C-I-O-N. Mm -hmm. Okay. The word spurious, I had always said spurious, but it's spurious. Okay. I learned okay. that from watching The Simpsons. And citadosh? That's not how it's pronounced. Synecdoche. Who? who? <clears throat> I thought that was an upstate City. <laughs> yes, I know. Synecdoche. It does sound a lot like okay. Synecdoche. And it means? <clears throat> <clears throat> Synecdoche is a Greek, it's from the Greek, mm -hmm. and it, it's a word for um, a trope okay. in prose or poetry, and it means something, it's a s small word meaning something large. Okay. For instance, um, boards. For the stage, okay. or fifty sail instead okay. of fifty ships. Okay. Um, are there some writers whose copy you were very are ha, have been hesitant to touch, even if there are grammatical errors or spelling errors? Yes, yes. Um, right now, I think the one who we have to be most careful with is George Saunders, because. George Saunders often writes in the voice, his narrator will be somebody who is not over-educated, and he wants that effect. He's, that's the voice of the character. Spelling shouldn't matter so much in something like that because you don't have to repeat bad spelling unless it's an example of maybe a child's misspelling. So we're careful about deciding whether or not to change the spellings in a piece by George Saunders or to change the grammar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, probably a lot more profanity in copy than there was when you came to the New Yorker, what, more than 35 years ago, is there? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, under William Sean, it, Mr. Sean thought there was no reason to print profanity or to mention any bodily fluid, for that matter, and he had quirks about various things that often puzzled writers, but... When a writer, a reporter, is quoting something that someone said and a vulgar expression is part of what the person said and it's germane to the article, then um, Mr. Sean would have to think that over and decide whether to permit the use of the vulgarity. And, and he did, in a, you know, famously in a piece by Calvin Trillin, I think. But then it has loosened up a lot. Um, the piece that opened my eyes and kind of ruined me. In fact, it was a piece about the rapper Earl Sweatshirt by Califasana, which quoted a lot of tweets. And the things that the kids are saying in tweets are just one vulgarity after right, the other. Right. And it was my job to make sure all those four-letter words were spelt right. <laughs> and it just kind of ruined me. <laughs> after that, I stopped querying those, those things in print. You know, I used to always wonder, well, do we have to use that four-letter word just as an intensifier? So it, you have to think it over. Sometimes maybe I still query it out, but then I seem like a prude. It does seem to me sometimes that certain writers are goading me. They, they find subjects who will say really incredibly dirty things, mm -hmm. and then it's because it's in a quote, it should be permitted. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, my sense is that certainly the, the New Yorker is one of the, I think many people feel it sets a standard for how people should write, you know, we you know for the, you know, just not the, just the art, not just the artistic part, but also the, the grammatical part. I mean, would you agree? I mean, it seems to be the place, the go-to place. Well, the New Yorker has been traditionally a conservative force on the language. We're not a conservative magazine politically or any other way, but we are guarding the language. The language is going to change, but that doesn't mean we have to rush it. 
is our feeling. And so we respect the conventions of, of the past. And what would you say, I think we have about a minute left, is, has been the most rewarding part of your job? Working with the writers, I think. Um, I think immediately of John McPhee, of getting to work on his pieces, and more, more recently, of actually having a, a personal correspondence with him about things like the words for people who live in Pittsburgh, you know, meaning um, Pittsburghers or Yinzers. We mm -hmm. just have fun discussing these things, and I'm really delighted that, that okay. it's come to that. Okay. Come a long way from Cleveland geographically and... I don't know, what's the word? <laughs> well, it's, it's not intellectually, oh. but we could say professionally. I professionally, guess, right? okay, okay. <laughs> We're out of time. I want to thank Mary Norris for joining me. Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen has just been published by W.W. Norton and Company for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.